When the humorous James Thurber was writing for the New York editor Harold Ross in the 1930s and 1940s, the two men often had very strong words about commas. It is a pleasant to picture the scene, two hard-drinking alpha males in serious chilbies smacking big desks and barking at each other over the niceties of punctuation. According to Thurber's account of the matter, in The Years with Ross, 1959, Ross's clarification complex tended to run something to the extreme. He seemed to believe there was no limit to the amount of clarification you could achieve if you just kept adding commas. Thurber, by self-appointed virtuous contrast, saw commas as so many upturned office chairs unhelpfully hurled down the wide open corridor of readability. And so they endlessly disagreed. If Ross were to write red, comma, white, comma, and blue, with the maximum number of commas, Thurber would defiantly state a preference for red, white, and blue, with none at all, on the provocative grounds that all those commas make the flag seem rained on. They give it a furled look. If you want to know about editorial commophilia as a source of antagonism, read The Years with Ross. Thurber once went so far as to send Ross a few typed lines of one of Wordsworth's Lucy poems, repunctuated in New Yorker style. She lived, comma, alone, comma, and few could know when Lucy ceased to be, comma, but, comma, she is in her grave, comma, and, comma, oh, comma, the difference, comma, to me. But Ross, it seems, was unmoved by sarcasm, and in the end, Thurber simply had to resign himself to Ross's way of thinking. Why the problem? Why the scope for such differences of opinion? Aren't there rules for the comma just as there are rules for the apostrophe? Well, yes, but you'll be entertained to discover that there is a significant complication in the case of the comma. More than any other mark, the comma draws our attention to the mixed origins of modern punctuation.